There's uh, an awful lot of movement. Hey everyone, today we're tearing down the Sapphire RX 7600 Pulse. So we already did the review of the 7600 using the reference model AMD card, and we have a teardown of that one. This one came in kind of late in the review cycle, so we're, we've done the thermal testing, we're gonna do the teardown and see how it differs from AMD's model, because AMD is still in a spot where it's not really directly competing with its board partners yet, in the same way that Nvidia is doing, whether or not it says that's what it wants to do. So Sapphire has potentially a lot to offer here where AMD intentionally left things on the table because it was focused on the GPU core. So let's get started with the teardown. Before that, this video is brought to you by Montex Metal DT24 Base. This two fan tower cooler keeps a simple black and metal look to match most build aesthetics. And it runs a six heat pipe design with two towers and two fans for higher performance air cooling. The metal DT24 base can also accommodate taller memory modules because it cuts back the fin stack closest to the first DIMM slot. The metal DT24 base uses a standard mounting mechanism and is easy to install. Learn more at the link in the description below. So here's the pulse. The RX 7600 cards start at $300. The partner models, who knows? They'll be all over the place. But they start at $300. Just this one probably will be a little bit higher. We don't know what the price is right now today, though. For the design, pretty straightforward. So they're using a plastic shroud for the entirety of the card, except the back plate, which is a metal back plate, and that's a good thing. For the design, they're going with a partial flow through area here. So the heatsink overhangs the PCB by uh, about two inches or so. And for that, they're pushing the air straight throughout the back of the card with very large spacing for this sort of grill. And that's a good thing. It's good that there's not a ton of resistance there just for the sake of design. They've actually punched out a large enough hole to allow the air to get through it. If we look at the front, the fans they're using uh, only the size of a PCIe slot plus a little bit here. So they don't have all the height in the world to work with for the fans. So these are fa fairly standard fan sizes. But Sapphire has now switched its blade design over so that you can see the blade carries on into the next blade, forming a cage around the fan. So you see this a lot on cards where they want to maintain some more direction and pressure as they force the air straight down into the cooler and minimize uh, perhaps noise as it bleeds out around the edges. The fin stack underneath is horizontal, so it goes this way. And that's different from some of the other cards, like the AMD reference card we looked at. So instead of exhausting all of its air up here, although some will escape, it is mostly going to be pushing air out the back over here, and then a little bit out the front as well. Uh, philosophically, there's differences in this in that now you are, instead of pushing air into a glass panel and into the motherboard, you're hopefully pushing it straight out of the computer. Realistically, this isn't the only element that matters. Just doing horizontal fins doesn't mean anything without factoring in the rest of the design. Both can work very well and both can work very poorly. And you can see they've got a hole punched out of the shroud here for exhaust uh, towards the front of the case and or somewhat intake from the front of the case as well. And this is a good thing. So Sapphire has done well to not cover up its exhaust paths. Okay, so we were just getting ready to tear it down and I immediately noticed this. There is a huge amount of play in here. I'm kind of concerned about I mean, I haven't looked at the thermal results yet, but that may be reflected in those. So I don't know how, how well that's showing up on camera, but there's uh, an awful lot of movement in this heatsink. And that's, so hopefully this is just the shroud and not the heatsink itself moving. Let's see if we can externally identify the source. I'm thinking it might be these screws are not all the way in. I don't see any, well, someone's been in here before. This screw's got some damage on it. It's possible it's from assembly, but this is supposed to be fresh off the line. I don't know if they inspect them for media or maybe more likely this is just a sample that was rushed through. First thing, instead of loosening the screws, I'm gonna try and tighten them. That tightens, but there is a spring under it, so. That also can tighten. Maybe these aren't tight enough. That's not really much better. Something's something's going on with this. I don't know. Oh, oh, that's already tightened. Okay. So they're reusing an I.O. plate. You can see here there's no screw. 
uh, but there's also nowhere for a screw to fasten to, even if there were one here. So this is a reused I.O. plate. Not the worst thing in the world, but that does make me wonder if maybe that screw should have been there to anchor this entire thing. But um, let's just start taking it apart and see if it becomes evident. Oh, that's right. The first thing I wanted to show. So Sapphire, one of the things they've actually been really good at historically has been easily replaceable fans. Let's see if they stuck to that philosophy on these cheaper cards. So what they've done is normally they'll have a uh, pin to pad solution where all you do is pull a screw and swap the fan. You don't need to get inside of the card itself. Nope, they have not kept that. It is easy to get the fan out because it's only one screw, but there's still a cable underneath. So unfortunately, this model does not have the easy swap fans for RMA. Now, this is a cheaper card, so maybe that's a cost-cutting measure where they just handle the RMA for you, but it's always nice to be able to just pull a fan and swap it as an end user and not have to dissect the entire thing. Okay, we're going to start with these screws, and then we'll work our way in towards the GPU leaf sprain, which is what this bracket is right here. Card definitely feels cheap. Normally, Sapphire's Pulse models, they they tend to give off a, a little bit more of a quality feeling, at least than reference. But because this one has the loose heat sink and shroud, it feels a little less put together, maybe in the literal sense. As for whether that actually impacts things, I'll need to look at the numbers. And once we open this fully, we should have a better idea, too. What is that? Is that like someone's blood or something? It's like a nice, it's like a hardened, crystallized blood. I, I think that's actually just some kind of maybe Loctite or something, like a red Loctite, but I'm not sure. Okay, so disassembly, that is actually really interesting, weird. I don't think I've really seen that before. Well, not in 15 years, but... Okay, this is kind of cool. So I have to give them credit for this. So Sapphire, it looks like, and I'm assuming this is a usability or serviceability decision, and even if it's not an intentional one, it works out that way. But the looseness in this shroud, I think, is the rest of this loose? No. Okay, so the looseness we were feeling was in the shroud, which means it's those those screws, wherever they're socketed into, it's maybe there's some play in there. but. The end result, this is very abnormal. Like you have to understand that normally the hundreds of cards I've taken apart, normally the heat sink is seated and screwed into the shroud, and you can't separate them until you pull the heat sink off of the GPU and the core components. So what Sapphire has done instead is make the shroud easily separable, and you can see we have direct access to the fan cable, which is actually awesome. I love this because normally these are kind of a pain in the ass to get to. So if you did happen to have a fan die, which is not the most, it's not that common, but it is, it is the most common uh, GPU RMA reason from what we understand. If you had a fan die, you pull out the one, two, three, four, five, six screws that I just pulled out, flip the shroud upside down, uh, disconnect the fan cable, and then you swap the fan, put it back on, and you never have to disturb the thermal pads or the thermal paste. So this is actually pretty awesome. I like that. A little bit of modularity in there. Unfortunately, it works against them in the feeling cheap department, but otherwise, it's a good uh, good approach to getting some serviceability. Uh, and as for the fan spec, let's see. These are NTHK fans. I don't really want to take off the damper here. It's a 12 volt. 12 volt 0.35 amp fan. Okay, so there's your actual cooling solution. A little dinged up in some places, uh, which I don't personally care about, but I'm mostly just trying to understand why this card was, was loose still, I guess. So we've got the eight pin up top, there's horizontal fin stack here, some raised and lowered areas, lowered where the fan clearance is needed. It looks like there's one larger heat pipe. Let's check the size on that. 
This heat pipe to me looks like an eight. No, that's a six, okay. So it's got a six mil pipe here that might continue to here. It looks like maybe a two heat pipe design. Let's take it apart further and find out. No dual V BIOS on this card. But dual V BIOS on a $300 card, assuming they are able to hit or get close to that price, would be kind of a waste of the user's money anyway. All right, so here comes the leaf sprain. Definitely easy to take apart so far. We probably want to take the, actually it's not secured into the IO plate at all, so I think it's just loose right now. Yep. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting bumper placements here. Just some rubber bumpers providing some support for the heat sink, preventing some rattle probably. And as it tightens down and socks in, the back plate is secured via screws through the front side and into the back plate. So memory modules, they've got two to the right of the GPU, two above it, and it just doesn't really matter here, but just for educational purposes, a lot of times memory that's along this edge runs the hottest because it ends up getting stuffed in where the PCIe slot is. It doesn't have much room to, to breathe but none of this runs particularly hot. Anyway, this GPU core. For the cooler, so AMD, I didn't notice this till reassembling it, uh, but AMD had a protrusion in the copper cold plate where it stuck out the size of the, uh, the GPU. And this one's just doing a flat copper cold plate contact patch with what looks to be a just an aluminum plate surrounding it, followed by nickel plated copper heat pipes. And they are running the two heat pipes through vertically across the die, uh, which gives them, it looks like about 70% coverage of the die area, maybe 80. And then that wraps up and around here. So you've got one that runs through above the inductors uh, or next to them, and then one that runs through at the far end of the heat sink to spread it as much as possible with the other end coming out over on the other side. So the VRM is entirely, for the most part, entirely on one side other than one phase, it looks like. They've got a MOSFET thermal pad sinking into a base plate that connects to a fin stack. And it's really not a lot of metal here. It's kind of a sparse heat sink compared to what we're used to taking apart. I think even at the $300 class, we've seen beefier things than this before, but I do remember the 2060 series cards, some of them feeling awfully thin for what they were at the time and those were around the same price. So it may just be a, a race to the bottom in terms of margin, but as long as the cooling's adequate, that's all that really matters. So for the board layout, you see the whole VRM is over here. They've got a couple other phases spread around with their own thermal pad. So we've got one phase here that looks like it's gonna be a memory phase. That, I don't know, maybe that's a, that might be memory, I'm not sure though and we'd have to probe it to, to be certain. It's another phase down here, but otherwise the core, most of it's all over here. They also have a few fuses spread around. So this right here, this gold cap with the white center, that's a fuse. And then there's actually two more up over here near the PCIe header. Those two are fuses. These don't necessarily prevent a failure but they make it much easier to diagnose a failure once it's happened. So this is probably more useful for Sapphire's RMA department than for anyone else. But if you were capable of repairing your own board, it might be useful for you as well to determine the cause of a failure. We've used them for troubleshooting things in the past as well. Okay, now we're going to take the back plate off and see what they're doing, if anything, on the back side there. So like I said, no dual V BIOS. They've got a blank header. Uh, up here for for something on another board probably. Actually, there's some more. You can see some more blanks right there. One of those could possibly be for a VBIOS switch on a higher end model or something. But they are unoccupied on this card. 
It's actually a blank for a controller right here as well. Okay, it looks like the I.O. plate can actually stay on. I mean, this is pretty nice. It's, sometimes it's the small touches that really make a card different. The fact that you don't have to take the I.O. plate off, there's always a lot of extra screws for that to completely separate the PCB from everything. That's To me, that's a nice touch. It's like totally irrelevant to everyone else, but pretty much every card we take apart, this has to come off, and it's just kind of a pain. Not like it's a big deal, but... So for the plate here, they are not leveraging it to sink any heat. It's just a, just for looks, maybe some rigidity, uh, although that rigidity is betrayed by the uh, plastic shroud dancing around when, whenever you pick it up. But no sinking, so they could do thermal pads into the back or something to pull some heat away. On a, a card of this power level, probably not really going to matter that much. There's a lot of other places they could improve the cooling instead if they wanted to. That starts to become a lot more relevant as you increase the, uh, the power, especially the memory. Just looking around the board, there's another blank header over here, so you can actually see where they've recessed the PCB a little bit to give some clearance. That's got three pins. One of them is a 5 volt. So that could be for an RGB connector if you wanted to synchronize RGB in your GPU or something to the rest of your computer. They've left it blank. Uh, so this is either a reused board from another design. I haven't taken apart enough Sapphire cards recently to know. Or it's a board they intend to use for a higher spec design, like maybe a flashier model with dual V BIOS and an RGB connector and charge an extra 50 bucks or something. So that's it for the teardown. Uh, overall, the aspect I liked about this card was how easily separable the shroud was from the rest of it. It's, you know, when you take apart as many video cards as we've done here over the years, it's the really small details that stand out. And while this is not a new concept, I was able to recall a couple I'd taken apart like a decade ago. It's, it's also not common. And whether or not Sapphire intends it to be a quality of life feature, it does end up being one. So just being able to access the fans separately is always a great feature because although failure of a fan is relatively uncommon, uh, it is still the leading cause you might RMA a video card, especially if you buy it used or something where the fans may been clogged with dust and kind of beaten up over time. So uh, that was kind of nice to see. Now, there's not a crazy amount of surface area here. The fin density is pretty standard as well. Heat pipes, they've gone with a total of two. So they have a two pipe design, which is what AMD was doing as well. So uh, that may be some design guidance or they've just both independently determined that's sufficient to cool the, the card. And we'll have thermals for the AMD reference one, at least in our main review. And everything else is pretty straightforward and simple. There's a few blanks where they could add on if they wanted to for a, another product in the future. but. We don't have any major complaints with this. Assembly was fine, easy to take apart, relatively easy to maintain if you needed to. The biggest complaint, I guess, was the looseness of the shroud early on before disassembly. So that seems like uh, like there's just some play in where the screws are securing it because it wasn't a tension issue after we checked that. So there's some play there. Makes it feel a little cheap. Um, anecdotally, when we ran the testing for thermals, I didn't notice any rattling. That would be the only thing I'd really be concerned about. Uh, it doesn't seem loose enough to rattle in use. It seems more like a, you pick it up and it just feels kind of flimsy, but I still I don't really know why. But it just seems like a weird thing to pass through to the product because it does make it feel cheaper. So anyway, that's it for this one. Pretty straightforward. And design-wise, we'll talk about the thermals and the reviews. And you can see how it does there compared to AMD's reference model. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, as always. And we'll see you all next time.